Well, hello everybody! Uh, as you may have intuited, the uh, the decor has changed a bit, the surroundings are a little different. Long story short, and straight to the point, Enthusiast Gaming and The Escapist and Movie Bob Productions have uh, not renewed the contract by which my material was appearing uh, once again on The Escapist for the last uh, couple of years. Kind of a bummer on my end, I have to assume also on theirs, uh, you know, it's been a tough year for everyone. Business is business. And that's really the long and short of it. Uh, you know, it's being business stuff, it's both boring and also stuff that's not like, you know, for broadcast on public YouTube promotion channels. When you're doing freelance, partial freelance, consulting video type of work under contract, sometimes business goes the way that you want it to go, sometimes it doesn't. This being the internet, I'm well aware I can't stop speculation from stuff, so I'm not even going to try. But no, no drama, no fuss. You know, I'm very glad for the work that I did there. I'm really happy, uh, you know, just personal fulfillment wise that I got the chance to join up and when this was restarting and help revitalize and rebuild that site, restore some of that reputation. That's, you know, very uh, positive thing in my regards. Uh, no ill will to anyone working there. You know, they got a lot of great creators. But like I said, this is no bad guys. I mean, the only real bummer for me on my end is just, you know, personal feeling wise. I wish that this didn't have to come together in the timing wise, right in the middle of the October programming, the, the Schlocktober stuff on Big Picture, because I know that that's a lot of people's favorite thing that the Big Picture does. So in the interest of just making sure everyone knows that that flow is not getting interrupted, this is what's going to precede this little announcement video here. You know, because we make the Schlucktober episodes in advance in general, so they're already banked. This is the one that uh, otherwise would have been airing Tuesday or Thursday of next coming week. And you're going to see the others, uh, the previous ones and the later ones that uh, would have been part of this year get re-uploaded to this channel in uh, in short order. In fact, uh, you are going to see uh, the more recent big picture uh, episodes and materials, Escape to the Movie stuff and some uh, Game Over Thinker stuff that was produced under the uh, the recent recently concluded contract with The Escapist now uh, get uploaded to this channel. Uh, big picture, I wanna keep that uh, going uh, on semi-regular schedule as is here. And uh, I've got a uh, few things that were also in the works that we're gonna be dropping in November, December. Uh, Adam Sandler, really that good is uh, mostly complete still coming, but especially now, the speed, frequency, and uh, you know the quality and ability of that to keep on coming up is uh, very much uh, contingent on uh, getting those Movie Bob Patreon numbers to uh, start coming back up again. So uh, please, as this is now uh, officially, once again, the main total source of uh, Movie Bob content, uh, if you are a fan, follower, viewer of these things, and you are not, uh, you know, tossing some coins in the cup for the uh, Patreon, or you haven't in a while, the link is below here. Please uh, be my guest to do so. And uh, for now, enjoy this uh, next new episode of uh, Schlocktober. And otherwise, uh, yeah, you know, more to come, more information, more content, more fun stuff. Hey, you know, the only constant is change, folks. And, uh, oh, with that in mind, please vote. People will tell you correctly that the Japanese giant monster or kaiju genre took a turn away from quasi-serious science fiction disaster movie territory toward being more family-friendly action-adventure films with an eye specifically on the child audience that bought up action figures of Godzilla and company toward the end of the 1960s and full-on into the 70s. Not always as a criticism, indeed, many have argued that the greater willingness to embrace the whimsical side of sci-fi so wholeheartedly on a tier budget is what helped make Japan's big screen genre fair of the era so distinctive and in demand, it's simply a clear, observable fact. Less clear are the influences that drove this change in the first place, though chief among the contributing factors was likely the genre coming to most prominently be represented in the national psyche overall on children's television, and that was due overwhelmingly to the legacy of the man arguably most responsible for bringing Godzilla and the ensuing kaiju genre to life in the first place. Japanese special effects legend and all-around cinema veteran Eiji Tsuburaya, who pioneered the suitmation and miniature photography techniques used to create the Toho giant monster menagerie, along with dozens of other practical special effects techniques considered distinct to Japan in that era, and subsequently took his expertise to television in his final years as his Tsuburaya Productions established itself as a powerhouse 
house in Japanese television with the trend-setting Ultraman franchise, which probably did more than anything to establish giant monster sci-fi and the rest of the so-called tokusatsu genre as most popular by far with a kid audience. After all, Godzilla movies at their peak were coming out at a clip of about once a year or so, whereas Ultraman was on TV every week. In any case, while Tsuburaya Productions kept its focus to the world of TV and tie-in features from their TV programming for the most part, they did take in the odd swing at original theatrical productions as well, occasionally in collaboration with their founders old mates at Toho. And that was the sort of arrangement that resulted in our subject for today, a genuinely strange obscurity with the ignominious distinction of being the only Toho-produced kaiju feature to have never received any official release or language translation outside of Japan, and remember, they were okay with everyone knowing about Godzilla's revenge. Why'd you come here? I just wanted to see you. Hmm. Your folks will get kind of worried, won't they? I don't think so. They're hardly home any time at all. Oh. Oh. Gabra! Gabra? Himself! Let's get out of here! But yes, 1972's Daigoro vs. Goliath is probably the most overtly kid-targeted kaiju production Toho signed its name to prior to the rebirth of Mothra movies in the 90s. It's brightly filmed, the cinematography is colorful, the characters are played for broad comedy slapstick, and the production design is packed with wacky Rube Goldberg props, amusement park gags, and a general toy maker vibe that feels heavily indebted to western surreal absurdist family comedies of the period like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, opening in media res with a hapless inventor failing to win an invention contest with a flying bicycle after explaining that he competed in such events in the first place to raise money for Daigoro the Hungry Monster, which is apparently a matter of some controversy. A series of flashbacks then fills in what that's all about. Evidently, a number of years ago, a submarine accident roused a female sea monster from her sleep and caused her to attack the Japanese coast, and for a change... conventional weapons were enough to kill one of these. Unfortunately, it was subsequently discovered that the monster in question had recently given birth and was likely acting in self-defense, leading the Japanese government and regretful citizenry to agree to assume care for the now-orphaned cub, which they've named Daigoro, setting him up on a small island reserve with his own personal handler, food supply, and ginormous outhouse. Okay, interesting place to decide to answer the mechanics of how one of these things takes a shit, but fine. Also, yeah, that's our star attraction for the 85 minutes this runs, so now you're probably getting a good sense of why there aren't six or seven more Daigoro vs. movies. Still, as far as the bipedal, pangolin, hippo, dinosaur story is concerned, happy ending under the circumstances? Well, no, because fast forward something like a decade, and this is a 70s kids movie, so it's actually kind of cynical. <laughs> あなたは彼のために少し寄付したいと思いませんか寄付なのいや嫌いですよ部長さん部長さんありがとうおばさんおばさん<笑><笑><笑><笑> In fact, it's by far the most interesting thing about it. For a movie that's totally playing on the very simple, straightforward attention spans and moral conscience of the average six-year-old, its presentation of the grown-up world of early 70s Japan is relentlessly bleak. The main plot driver for about two-thirds of the film is that society's desire to do right by Daigoro has pretty much worn out. He isn't a novelty anymore, he's getting too big, and it's starting to cost the government too much to feed him, and public backlash against raising taxes even a little bit to do so is so strong. Oh, uh, much like Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster from one year earlier, this was a message movie. Jet Tokyo. 
三年間暮らせるのです。これはあと何年この地球で生きていくことができるんじゃろう。百年、五十年。いや、海の次に空を失えばもう生きていくことはできんのじゃ。That the discourse among pretty much everyone, save for an activist community of mostly children, has boiled down to should we euthanize the one of a kind living thing that we orphaned, or just start putting drugs into his food non consensually that will stunt its growth? <laughs> <laughs> because nothing says whimsical children's fantasy like allegories for austerity politics, and played in very stark terms via subplots about Daigoro's morally conflicted zookeeper and his managers, and the wacky inventor's best friend, an alcoholic carpenter who becomes a fierce Daigoro advocate who then goes cold turkey so he can give the money he saved to the cause, only to have his wife spend it out from under him. <laughs> Anyway, that all gets upended because the other monster you've been expecting to show up because its name was in the title shows up, and yeah, you know where this is going, and we are in fact doing the full Rudolph here. Hey, uh, buddy, sorry we went all Harrison Bergeron on you back there, but uh, there's kind of a mutual problem only you can solve, so we good? And let it not be said that the outlandishness of the rest of the film eases up at all during the finale, which, along with both monsters looking thoroughly ridiculous and not at all suited for combat. Features odd details like the humans trying to throw a tarp over Goliath's laser emitting horn. And a kid friendly solution for getting rid of him altogether. According to apocryphal monster movie lore, Goliath's role in the story was originally meant to be filled by a guest starring Godzilla himself, but Toho changed their mind at some point for some reason. <laughs> To date, the film is still not officially available outside of Japan, but it's easier to find than it used to be, and it's definitely an experience. <laughs> and next week, I've got at least one more of those for you.